not sure what happened. I was okay yesterday, but this morning I woke up and I started to sneeze and crying out. Uh, don't worry, no COVID. I just tested one single <laughs> bar. All right, so uh, I will not be doing that long MAO anyway. So all I need to do is today just give you all the information that you need. Then of course, if you feel my voice a little bit not usual, noise loud, then you must understand the reason for that, yeah? Okay, all right. So let's just begin today's MAO, all right? It's not easy to doing MAO while you're not feeling well, to be honest with you. Okay, all right. Today is the 4th of May, 2022. Today is the important day because later tonight, we will have the FOMC meeting outcome. Now, definitely all eyes will be on Jerome Powell and he, whatever he say after the outcome. Now, we all know that most likely it will be a 50 basis point. I can't see any reason for him to go for 75 basis point this round, but that could be a chance of 75 basis point in June. Because for a Federal Reserve I mean, chairman, he has to follow some SOP. So based on what we saw the last few uh, weeks, the inflation data is coming off a little bit. The employment data are still reasonably good. So there is no way for him to actually pull a 75 basis point and freak the market out. So it makes sense that he will do 50 basis point. It makes sense for him to tell the market that, you know what, we are still okay. We will still progressively do this then he might be able to give us some shade of lights of when he to do the QT, and that's all. So what I feel is that the market might sell towards the FOMC meeting. The market may react when the result come out, but after that is sell, right? If let's say Jerome Power doesn't sound too hawkish, it may actually bring some buying into the market. But again, again, we will have to watch the market closely for today, right? So I'll share with you more in greater detail later. All right, definitely, so, right? Today earnings, we saw AMD data was pretty good. And we also saw that Starbucks uh, data was pretty decent. So that was too spot on for me. All right. So before we start the day, once again, disclaimer apart as usual, my job is to give you my view on the market. Your job is to trade according to whatever you're supposed to do, okay? All right. Now, today, I start off joke of the day. Sorry to wrap it in again, Jim Kramer. Today, I'll wrap you in again because there's something that I'll share with you what Jim Kramer says on Paul Tudor Jones and what Paul Tudor Jones says regarding this market. And I think it's quite important for us to take note, yeah? All right, so this is actually a joke shows that the bull and the bear, especially the bear saying this, what do you mean? It, this isn't a comedy central, all right? Comedy central is a, is a channel whereby you see all the jokes. And of course, <laughs> the picture shows that this is definitely Jim Kramer. All right, a very aesthetic looking, crazy looking and stuff like that. So probably people all say this, if you want to trade in the market, just follow what Jim Kramer says, but do opposite. All right, so why do we want to drop Jim Kramer today? Now, let me just show you this first to start out with. Now this morning, uh, CNBC correspondent, uh, what they call interview, uh, this Paul Tudor Jones. Now, who is Paul Tudor Jones, right? I'll come to him later, okay? Later, yeah. But the point is this Paul Tudor Jones is a billionaire hedge fund manager, just that you know. First. So, when he was being asked about tonight's uh, FOMC result, he actually says that, right, Jerome Power should look out for a new job. And that actually, uh, in chorus with what Jim Rogers said about, about this uh, Jerome Power back then. So I'm not too sure whether they have communicated. So obviously it's a sarcasm, but definitely you can see that. You can definitely see that, right? Uh, Jim Kramer was not that happy with that. And Jim Kramer came in to defend this Jerome Powell and says that, you know, that uh, maybe probably Jerome Powell has figured it out and how to actually tackle this current situation. So you can see that uh, he was pretty uh, <laughs> charged up for his defense. He feel that the current yield is, some, is okay, but it's nothing too da damaging. He felt that things are still doing fine. He felt that, right, the Jerome Powell and his team is still pretty in control. And of course, even though the earnings are not very good, he still believed that the overall earnings are okay. 
And in fact, itself, right, he calls for buy recently, remember? He calls for buy. So with all this thing ongoing, it seems that, right, we have a two different camp here. And this is whereby I will want you to take a look later on uh, this tool and see whether which side do you think is much more correct, all right? Let me just uh, make of this right now. For those who just join us, okay, once again, I'll repeat, I'm not feeling that well today. So if you uh, apology, if I need to sneeze while I'm on life right now, yeah, apology on that. So according to an article that I saw on the internet, CNBC recently just reported, right, the US economy growth unexpectedly declined by 1.4% last quarter. And, but the thing is this, at the same time, more than 57% are currently buy rating. It's the highest percentage since September 2011. So that means that we have a lot of Wall Street people calling for buy. This is very interesting. People are calling for buy. And the thing is this, even this uh, Jim Cramer says that the bear market is over on the March the 25th. But of course, we all know that the stock market continues to fall a little bit more after that day, he called for buy. So the thing is this, as you can see now, most stocks are not doing that well. In fact, to drop it in, right, uh, Jim Cramer did give a magnificent, magnificent seven calls. I mean, he gave, calls, he gave seven counters for buying, and a good chunk of them are down by 50% to even 90%. So don't forget that, right, you know, back in 2008, that was the epicenter of where the uh, Lehman crisis, but just before Bastion went under, Jim Cramer came in to say this, Bastion is fine. Do not take out your money. But, and I do just to prove it to you, really, I managed to bring this out for you. I go and dig it out for you. Indeed, on 18th of March, 2020, 2008, Jim Cramer actually says that Bastion is fine. But y'all remember what happened? Bastard collapsed. All right. So now in 2020, that was about 12 years later, Jim Cramer unveiled the magnificent seven stocks that should be a good buy to keep in portfolio. But the crazy part is this. Look at them right now. All right. You can see they are down by between 80 to 44%. All right. The only thing that survived was Tesla. All right. Right, so Square was down at 44, PayPal down by 58, and so forth, all right? So the thing is this. I'm not trying to say that I'm better than him or whatever. I'm pretty sure that Jim Cramer got his own reason for call for buy back then itself. But sometimes I think if you're going to do everyday forecasting, right, it's going to be very tiring and it's not going to be easy with the, all the uncertainty in the market. But the point I'm going to stress today is not to rub Jim Cramer. It's because he says that he feel that the market is a buy, but Paul Tudor Jones says it's a sell. So the question is this, who should we listen? All right. So I'm going to cover now regarding this uh, Paul Tudor Jones in a short moment time. All right. But before that, let's just look into tonight's key data. Now, tonight data will be the ADP data. As I mentioned to you on Monday, the numbers is quite interesting. The previous number is 455,000, and today we are looking at a lower number. It's the same number that the uh, NFP is also looking at. Now, ADP is the private sector, NFP is the public sector. Okay, so if this number is really down, then maybe this uh, Jerome Powell and friends will have to be a little bit more dovish. But I don't think so, because already he said he doesn't really care. And he really wants to bring the market down in a way. So I don't think so. This will change his mind. But nonetheless, Wall Street has a good way to play around with words. So just be very careful, OK? Now, what time will the data be coming out, right? As you can see now, this is based on Singapore time, OK? So which means that at 2 AM Singapore time tonight, Okay, uh, Jerome Powell and friends will give us the rate hike. And as you can see again, the market is looking at 50 basis point. 
And uh, at 2 30 is whereby you have the press conference at 2 30, whereby he will come out and talk to all the journalists and they will ask him a lot of questions. I'm supposed that. And that is where usually the market may break, make or break. Lah. So I think that this morning, tonight, just rest early, don't, don't see the market too much, and then prepare yourself tomorrow morning, or you can wake up at 2 a.m. and we see the market. Okay. All right. Now, yesterday, you can see that the Dow Jones really went very sideways. There was a momentarily push up to 33,300. But after that itself, right, we saw the market basically coming back down again. The market just basically come back down as fast as it went up. So it was more like a pump and dump in my opinion. But of course, later on, they tried to do it again and they brought it down. So it was quite clear that the market was trying to push it up but the selling was even stronger. So this actually made me feel that the market is trying to push up to sell than to buy instead. So that is my main concern that I'm seeing right now. So let's look at what the correspondent had to say. Stock rises for the second straight day ahead of the expected Fed hike. So the thing is this, all looking for the pivotal Federal Reserve decision. And uh, first time in several days, sellers appear exhausted and shorts are a bit nervous than long. Now, this is actually a very interesting comment because I don't think anybody will have that feeling. Yes, maybe the selling is not as strong anymore because we're selling for how many days? So for them to actually say this is right, it just doesn't make so much sense to me. Yeah. Now, we all know that it's going to be a 50 basis point. We are pretty sure of that. But the thing is this, is actually now whether the QT, the monetary uh, tightening, would that be a big problem for the stock market? Because if the QT is really aggressive, the market may be spooked. So now the thing is this, this is where it gets very interesting, everybody, take a look. Now, billionaire hedge fund manager, Paul Tudor Jones, spoke to SCNBC Spotbox, say that, right, Fed tightening and signs of the economy is slowing. Capital preservation should be the main goal for investors. Now, when you say capital preservation, I think that it's pretty clear that it's actually going to cash. So now the thing is this, the stock market is doing okay. All right, the bond market is terrible. So to use the cash that we have to buy stocks makes some sense. But why would Paul Tudor Jones at this stage right now want you to go into capital preservation? So to me, that is where the thing, the light bulb come in. All right, as again, some people feel that, right, the market has been down for the last, uh, for their state down at 20%. So they feel that, right, it's a good time to buy. But I just kind of feel that, right, the market is just too early for buying. What do you think so? So while I think my little sneeze here is all right, do you think that Paul Tudor Jones is right? Now, if you think that Paul Tudor Jones is right, meaning that it's good to be um, to do capital preservation, right? Please key the word, he is right. Now, if you think that he is wrong, just key that he is wrong. Okay, let me see what's your answer while I take a little sneeze here. Okay, so we have Jerry who say he is right. Louis, also Anthony, Mohammed, Janet, Dennis. Okay, so basically all of you say that he is right. Okay, I'll come to more about him later. I did some research for you. That's gonna be interesting. All right, he says that you can't think of a worse environment than where we are right now for asset, financial asset. Clearly, you don't want to own bonds and stocks. Now, to me, it is a really big statement to come from a billionaire 
trader investor. Now, of course, you may say maybe he's playing a fast one like what he played before. But you see, uh, the history of him doesn't show that he like to play this way, whereby he called for sell, but he actually buy. His background doesn't have this little part here, his history. All right, he may be wrong, but he may not do that. So there's something that I feel that a little bit needing more of credit on this. And we all know that April is expected to be the best month. April, then, if not then, December is known to be the best month. But apparently now, April has become the worst month, right? And it's the worst month for the Nasdaq since 2008. So this is something very wrong here itself. And I felt that, right, this is actually a very dangerous uh, position that we're having right now. Okay, hold on a minute, yeah? Hold on a minute. Okay, sorry, apparently they want to check the power supply and they mentioned that they don't turn off the internet for one hour. I <laughs> said, no, we do we come, come back later then? Okay, so let's continue, yeah? Okay, so with all this thing, it actually tells me that, it does tell me that um, the boys, the bigger boys are calling for sell, but the common, common analysts, okay, our gurus are calling for buy. So that is whereby you probably get the mixed signal over here. And that's the reason why we want to really focus on how Paul Tudor Jones does his stuff, all right? So let me just bring you now to some little history of Paul Tudor Jones. Let's take a look. Now, Paul Tudor Jones, if you Google on him today, you will notice that he has all the key caption on him. Now, the point is this, is he says, all right, don't own stocks right now, preserve capital, facing the most challenging period, and don't want to own stocks and bonds and stuff like that. Now, Paul Dillard Jones, too, is an American billionaire hedge fund manager, a conservationist, and a philanthropist. All right. He basically now owns, I mean, I'm sorry, his, um, his current wealth now is $7.3 billion. Now, this number has been stagnant for quite a while. So I can tell you that, right, even you look carefully at George Soros, right, his wealth has also been stagnant for about $10 billion for a while. I believe that most of their money doesn't really grow directly because they don't have stocks. They don't own like Elon Musk, a stocks shareholder and stuff. They just buy, sell, make money. So the money that or the wealth that they have is really quite uh, not really real, in my opinion. It should be much higher than what is available to for the people to read. Yeah. Okay, now one, this is this is one part of it. But the point is this. Right, he became famous back then in 1987 for his call on the Black Monday when the Wall Street Dow Jones crashed basically 20%. So what happened back then was that, right, I dig up for you, he and his co-worker in Tudor Group, in particular in the second command, Peter Boris, spent hours huddled over graphs of the Wall Street crash of 1929, analyzed the historical market charts patterns, sales data and direct comparison to 1929 market preceding in the infamous crash. So with all the information, they felt that, right, the stock market in 1987 is going to crash. So two weeks before that faithful October day in 1987, Tudor Investment Group basically began to position themselves and then they basically prepared. And truth be told, on one single day, on the 19th of October, 1987, the Wall Street crashed down 22% in a single day, breaking obviously numerous records, including the largest ever percentage drop in a single time. And basically it's all right. You know what happened that even the television studies had redrawn the lower limit because they were throwing charts that had never been seen before. And of course, Paul Taylor Jones walked away $100 million profit. 
Now, at that time, it's about hundred million dollars profit. It's like equivalent to today about one billion dollar. At the time, Mr. Wright, he was still a very young guy because you can see he is born in nineteen fifty four. Okay, that means nineteen eighty seven when it happened itself, he was only thirty three year old. At thirty three year old to make one billion dollars approximately is really really impressive. All right, this is my point that I felt that he is there. But of course, some people will say that maybe it's a one hit wonder. Maybe it was just lucky. Maybe the market was very easy to manipulate. Maybe the market was very clear that it's a short and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Now, this is quite normal for you to think that way too. But then again, if you look back in 2020, right, that was like two years ago, Paul Dudu Jones was asked, and I know I covered this story before, and I remember this very well. Dudu Jones says that this crazy stock market runs reminds him a lot of the early 1999. Now, back then in 1999, we know that the NASDAQ went crazy and everybody was doing dot-com crisis, uh, craziness. Now, the thing that basically this article was, he said two things. Number one, he felt that this is going to be explosive. It might be crazy now. But when he was asked whether to get out of the train in this bull run, he said not really. He felt that the train may go a longer way, if you think about it. But then there's a curveball. A curveball came in to derail the stock market it could be an outbreak of a new coronavirus. Now, this is absolutely insane because we all know that, right? It's only I mean, in December where China has a virus, all right? But America, they didn't have talk about it. In fact, America had no virus back then. It was only in February to March. That's where the thing hit America. So for him to have this so-called view over here itself, right? Looks very, very interesting, right? Don't you feel that like he knows something that we all don't know? Or at least they've been reading up and they know that, hey, maybe just be careful and throw a curveball. And if you look at it right now, right, this is the chart. So this was the day where Paul Tudor Jones says that the market reminds him of the 1999. And then after that, the market dinged down a little bit before the market crashed down all the way. Now, did he break, did he short, right? I tried to Google on it, but he didn't really say much. It's more like he protected himself with some hedges, but he didn't say that he profited from it. So not too sure what happened, but to me, this is good enough to show that he does know what to look out for and he has an eye in the market, on the market, yeah? So with all this information, right, okay, in March 2020, which is actually at the low end here, okay, he actually came in and says that, right, America will beat the deadly coronavirus, okay? Will beat, yeah? I mean, but of course, we know that it didn't really beat it, but only under recent. But the scary part is this, okay? He said this, on March the 26th, he says that, right, the stock market will rebound in a few months' time. So which means that, right, the market really rebounded after a few months' time. So again, this shows that, right, he don't only call for sell, he also called for buy. And the thing is this, he was pretty spot on. So to me, when this guy now is telling me that I should be very careful and I should be getting out of stocks and children own stocks, capital preservation, you just cannot deny that, right? I'm getting a little bit jitter over here. And truth be told itself, right? It does tell me that maybe I just had to go slow on my long side than my short side. And that's the reason why I want to cover about him today. All right, so hopefully you guys uh, enjoyed that segment itself. All right, if you like that segment that I cover on Paul Tudor Jones, please key the word like, L-I-K-E. All right, I'll get some water for myself. All right, thank you guys. So rather than I say that whatever I say, you know, people ask me, Cal, who are you to call for market? Who are you to tell me that the market will go down? You know, you're not there and stuff like that. Okay, that's why I say, don't listen to me. Listen to Paul Tudor Jones then, okay? 
So his record is out already dig out for you. If you want to dig out more, Google on him, you may find a little bit more stuff, all right? So hopefully you guys will benefit from it. Okay, so now some global news. US re relief as China appeared to hit warnings about Russia. So apparently it's not right. US seems to feel that PRC did not provide any direct military support to Russia war. So it seems to be listening to America. Now this is actually a statement from America trying to boost up their, I mean, their status and try to tell China that, hey, you are a good boy, you know, you never do it. But to me, this is really propaganda. La. I mean, it's really, really trying to show that, you know, you don't do anything silly. If not, I will just do what I want to do. So we all know that US have been aiming at China for the longest of time. And of course, if China retaliate in any form, any way, it will be set, it could be entering into a trap. So that's why I feel that US is very good with all this stuff. stuff. They are really always one to step ahead of people and always able to turn around and get the best of it. So that's why. Uh, you can see that China is just keeping quiet. But say whatever now, it's just pointless. Okay, wait a minute. Uh, some PowerPoint issue here. Hold on. Okay, so now what is the situation now in this Russia-Ukraine war? Apparently, there are some statistics given that Russia has lost more than 680 tanks as of 12th of April. And now, just three days ago, the latest report on the 1st of May, they had lost about 1,000 tanks, 200 aircraft, and about 2,500 armored fighting vehicles. Now, FYI, uh, according to some sources, it says that right, Russia can do about 250 to 300 tanks per year. So to lose 1,000 tanks, if this is actually true, they have actually lost about three to four years of supply in just this war alone. So there are also reasons why Russia lost a lot of tanks because apparently communication was a big, big issue, satellite issue and stuff like that. There were many. And the very interesting twist right now, I don't think you can see on mainstream media. I, I, I think, I, I, I wonder why, but it is like that. Apparently from this Taiwanese talk show, it shows that, right, apparently, Right, Russia itself got bombed in the middle of the night. Yes, the outskirts of Russia got bombed. And who bombed it? You may think you should know the answer. So the thing is this, apparently, and now Zelensky is saying that, take note, in June, I will retaliate. Wow. In June, I will retaliate. And it seems that, right, instead of now being suffering the bombing, it seems that Zelensky is waiting for June to come and they will want to turn this around. And you can see now, the bombing itself is just not, not anywhere bomb. They bomb all the weaponry, the armories and stuff like that. And it's bombing Russia. So the thing is this, instead of Russia destroying Ukraine, now seemingly the opposite is happening. But when I actually Google this, right, I can't find a single ounce of uh, news on this. So obviously it's all right. You can see that, right, people don't want you to see certain things. So I say it's pretty interesting. Now, we all know that Putin is now going to go for cancer surgery. And this is where, again, you will get concerned. Now, apparently someone did say this. The only one, the only way to stop this war is that Putin kept himself killed. Now, of course... To die on the surgical table itself is one way, but I don't think so. Like, yeah, but definitely this is going to demoralize the current situation right now for Russia. I don't think so. All right. Now, the other news that came in yesterday was not really covered by the mainstream media, but uh, what happened was Alibaba share. Now, Alibaba share was trading at 102 the day before. Suddenly, the next day, Alibaba share gapped down and sold down all the way to $92, still down about nearly 10 plus percent. So the question is why suddenly Alibaba share down so much, right, in a, such a fast manner when the NASDAQ was doing okay. And then at the same time, the recovery was equally fast. So what actually happened? So I managed to get the data for you. It's quite interesting, take a look. So apparently Alibaba shares fall on China or in Hong Kong because of an uncompared rumor linking Jack Ma to a probe. 
And the probe actually says it's criminal coercive measures as an, on an individual that could be endangering national security. Oh my goodness, this is really crazy though. I mean, how can this be happening? But do you think it's possible? So apparently, all right, okay, what actually happened was this, as you can see over here, it's because of the character being used. So let me just bring to you now what actually really happened. And apparently now they are saying that he actually uh, under two charges, two very big charges, yeah? So let's take a look here. So apparently when the charges came out, okay, the original one is on the right side, the original one, okay, at nine o'clock, shows that, that this uh, they are going after a guy called Ma Mo. Right, ma something. So when you say that result, obviously in Alibaba, the only one prominent result had to be Jack Ma, is Ma Yun. So apparently this was what actually happened. Say that he's under, under very serious uh, you know, uh, investigation. So straight away, the stock market came down for the Alibaba share. But apparently one hour later, they changed the word to Ma Mo Mo, meaning, a person with surname Ma and name name. So not exactly saying that it belongs to Jack Ma. So straight away, the stock actually rebounded. <laughs> so it's quite interesting, right? Don't you feel that way? So from moment of Ma Mo, become Ma Mo Mo. So the question was this, is this really, uh, really uh, an error? Or you think that it's just a cover up? <laughs> not too sure what happened but you can see that the share actually rebounded quite strongly, right? Now, the thing is this, if you look at today's chart today, this is going today's chart, you can see that although the market share has recovered, but this morning, the selling continued. And people are now speculating that, right, this is actually true. Because they cannot see how can, a, a, what do you call a, a what do you call a, official uh, what it called announcement be wrong. It can't be a typo error of such a level because they all know that this will create a mayhem. So, but why would they suddenly change it around, right? We are not too sure, but definitely itself, right? Okay, my feel, which I told you before, that should be selling again. So I believe that, right, Jack Alibaba share will be going down to $92 in the near term. I believe that this Alibaba share will go down to $92 in the near term. I seriously apologize for today. I'm really not too sure what happened, but uh, it seems that I'm not feeling that well. But the thing is this, as you can see, that is really showing signs. And probably that's the reason why Charlie Mungo, do they have some news that we don't know that they know that something may happen. All these things is really a question mark, but I always believe that the charts will speak for itself. Yeah, so this is very, very interesting. Now, I'm gonna just continue this, don't worry. All right, as we can see now, we have all the data coming out and AMD and Starbucks have came out their data. AMD is better than expected. That's why after, after market, the data went out good. All right, okay, but then the chip side itself, they should suggest that chip making is definitely good, uh, definitely because it breaks demand. But it's just that now it's about this manpower supply issue. And of course, Starbucks came out better also, that they are looking at better, but still uh, it could be better if not from China. So apparently both sides for AMD and this Starbucks are okay. For Starbucks, I think I call for sell, so I'm wrong on this, so I apologize on that because I think that this counter couldn't be doing any better. But of course, we can see it pulls back after that. So let's see how it goes for later today, yeah? Now we all know that today it's a 50 minutes point, so it can be a simple, straightforward thingy. But main thing is that, right, is whether how much are they gonna lower down the trillion dollar balance sheet? So to me is that they have to do it fast because every every amount left in that is all right, multiplied by the interest rate will be very costly for the American government. All right, so it'll be at 2 a.m. today, yeah? Just let you know. 
All right, so now we cover really something brought into to let you think about it before tonight's FOMC meeting is regarding about inflation, the CPI data and stuff like that, okay? Yeah, this is Alibaba, uh, Hong Kong 9A chart. Yes, the one that I showed was the Hong Kong, Hong Kong chart, yeah, not the US one. Okay, so let me just share with you something here. You can see now, that the high CPI and high PE is always a very interesting event. So from 1990 itself, right, whenever you have this uh, low CPI and low PE ratio, you can see that this is where usually the big problem come in. So every time when this happened itself, you had a World War I, World War II, oil shock, Walker, dot com, GFC. So now the question is that now we are also having this problem, but we have no clue of what to label this because it seems like the market is accepting a lower earnings, but they have no reason to know what is happening. So there's no big label to actually tell you about this event because it's, like, it's just like slow death, but it's not a big, big movement that causes everybody to wake up. And now this lower number earning, right, is actually lower than the GFC time. So which means that the stock market now is 100% more expensive than GFC time, but yet itself, right, the earnings are actually entering negative. And the negativity is even lower than what happened in GFC time. So the stock market is double the price, but the earnings is actually in a negative position and is even lower than GFC. This is actually very scary, right? Don't you feel that way? So to me itself, right, it's actually a very scary moment right now. The things can go so bad that it might be really going to shock everybody. So now it makes sense for me why I felt that Paul Dillard Jones is saying that. And don't forget, I prepared this before this uh, talk to just this morning, Sherry. This was prepared like yesterday already. So you can see now, right, Merck's are showing that the full-year guidance is not good, warning that the box volume are dropping. So that actually shows you that import-export is actually going off. And because of the soaring import and inflation, the current uh, trade deficit is higher. So again, we have a problem trade deficit. Okay, it's not good. And you can see that, right, the consumer price index itself has been going up non-stop. So again, this shows that prices is going up, earnings is going down. That means there's only one word for this. When prices is going up and production and earnings going down, the word is stagflation. So this is a problem right here, right now. As you can see that, right, whenever there is such a thing happening, recession is always near the corner. So after this morning, sorry, yesterday, our Lee Hsien Long Prime Minister has said that right, inflation could be, sorry, there will be a recession within the next two years, might be, yeah? I did my own calculation. My belief is that there will be a recession by in fact earlier. Uh, I do see a recession coming in in January 2023 or earlier. All right, this is what I actually calculated. If let's say that I'm correct, we should see that. But of course, on the high side, every time when inflation hits the highest point, we also see that the stock market will rally after that. But before that itself, we will see some selling first. So what I'm trying to say is this, the inflation problem will bring the stock market lower. But once the market, the inflation hits the peak, and then turn your way around, you will notice that the stock market will rally big time. So that's the reason why I'm saying this. The next one, two months, there could be some serious selling in the market if we just look at this context right now. But then when that actually happens, inflation will come down by itself. That will be the best time to buy into the market. Okay? Now, whether to buy for how long, I think we let it be set, the market decide, but to buy from cheap will be a good time and a good idea. So that's why this guy, Bill Dudley, came in as a Bloomberg opinion columnist, and he actually said this, which I like. It's hard to know how much the US Federal Reserve will need to do to get inflation under control. It's very difficult, right? 
But it's one thing to certain. To be effective, it will have to inflict more losses on the stock market and bond traders so far. That means, in short, they have to bring the stock market down. So only when the stock market goes down, people will return to jobs and not think that it's better to stay at home to make money from the market. Because when more people go back to work, the economy will recover and inflation on its own will come off. So you can see that right now, right, in a very interesting way, that right now we have the employment, actually the jobless rate at a very low level. So which means that right, people are doing fine but the economy is not moving. That is a problem. So the question is this, if we look back into history, it shows that right now we are actually better than pandemic time, but the earnings are nowhere near there. And if you look at it now, right, in terms of people spending, and every time there's a recession, but the people are still spending. So it shows that, right, we have a very quick drop in spending, but almost instantly now the spending has became has came back in again. So it doesn't stop people from spending. So that's why basically the stock market will continue to rise regardless, and people will just keep on spending because it will not stop. So with all this information, it does tell us that right, okay, the second half of this year might be a very good time to load into stocks if once the stock market is at a lower level. Because now at the moment now, the number of millionaires, the number of people getting richer is so much more and it becomes very scary because these are all asset rich, not really economic rich. So that's why now, although we have more people become millionaires, but the stock market going up, but the earnings of the economy is not doing that good. So now if you put at it right now, right, at the moment now, the consumer confidence is actually at a very low end. So with the market at the low end right now, people not going back to work itself, the only way is this to go for it and press the stock market down as much as possible. And that will really make it work, okay? And of course, one counter or one sector of four will be the energy sector. You can see now, for 2022, right? The energy sector is the one that's doing very fine. The cash flow is very powerful, really a lot. Interest is there. And the one that's doing very badly is the technology and communication like Zoom, like Teladoc, all these are communication. So these are the counter to avoid. The one that look out for would be more towards energy. Maybe after six months later, you can look back at technology again, and look back at Teladoc again, all means like this uh, communication again, maybe they'll be able to buy. Okay, maybe three to six months, yeah? Three to six months. Then what you do, when three to six months later, right, the market, it will interchange. It means that by the time after that, right, energy price will come down because it's overbought, right? And then communication and technology will be a buy, all right? So watch out for these two sectors. I think Warren Buffer recently has really confirmed this buy, uh, buying more energy, makes some sense already, right? Point to you, Kai. All right, last but not least is all right. You know that the US natural gas has went up to now the high back in 2008. So despite all the technology, all the costing to bring price lower, it doesn't help. And now it's even higher than 08. So again, in 0809, we all know what happened, right? The market basically collapsed after that. So because high inflation will make things difficult and then that will increase costs and people may not want to go. And this will this will lead to one to the other. There will be a repercussion and things will get very, very messy. So that's why I believe that now Warren Buffett buying into all the, buying into those energy counters, right? makes a lot of sense and it shows that he really knows how to see things from a very far. Okay. All right. That will be all for the fundamental. I will go quickly now on the technical because first of all, today is FOMC meeting. There's really nothing much we can talk about in the technical side. Because likely the market will be pretty sideways. Yeah? So I'm going to make a fast one over here. Now today's China market is closed for holiday. This one is a CFD figure. As you can see now, it's still lowering. The number itself is 13,243. So until we reach there, then we will know whether, how would there be a dramatic recovery or this will be the start of a selling wave, okay? This one, let's skip first.
Okay, for the US stock market itself, right, we can see very clearly we have a bit of thing happening. The market is trying to stay above the uh, BNB support level, but each time it got rejected. So each time it got rejected, make me feel that right to shop towards this point here, which is the 32,243. So kind of believe that, right, if the market stays below OP, I think it's a shot towards pivot to first 33,021. Then after that, right, we may aim at this 32,243. The upside itself, right, it is possible that I just kind of feel it's limited. The most I can see is 33,468, but I just feel that this is a little bit too high for now. Now, NASDAQ is trying to hold its fault and it did hold itself very nicely at the support level over here. And But the today's right, the pivot two is very nearby. And uh, if the market loses pivot two, it will lose MLP at the same time. We may see some selling. KSI-wise is all right, it's still red in color. So that means that there should be some bit of more bearishness around it. S&P 500, also the same thing, trying to stay within the support level over here. So 4166 is a very key support here. If the market breaks below it, we may see a lower number and this can be as low as 3976. That is the uh, BMB extension minus one time one. Now Hong Kong today, we have a bit of a problem here. Hong Kong today is all right. Take note there. Yeah. Hong Kong today is a DJDD. So likely the market will be going down further. Today at the same time is a Omega. Omega meaning the opening half, opening and the high or opening and low is the same figure. Let me show to you now. Right, can you see that there's an Omega signal on our indicator? Hey, sorry. There's an omega signal here. Now that actually tells you that it's an omega day for today. So with doji directional day and omega day is out and the market breaks below the moving averages and the MLP, there is a possibility for the Hong Kong market to come down to this point here. And that's 20,675. And of course that is pretty near part. Yeah. All right. So traders does take note of that. Oh, yeah, something. I saw a message. Okay, let's continue. All right. Wait, sorry. Nikkei is trying to go up, right, because of the dollar that is a little bit weakening at the moment. But uh, Nikkei overall, the KSI is still a buy, but it's lowering. So the buying will be limited. Now, upside itself, right, will be at 27,266. But if we fail to stay above it, right, and breaks MLP, we should see coming down to 26,909. Okay. All right. So take care of that. Okay. Now, DEX, we have been talking about it and have been sideways for quite a while. I suspect that DEX will also be pulling back down to about 13,868. Okay, that will be the level that I think that DEX will come down and we will talk about this after that. And crude oil. Now crude oil, I've been pretty bullish, but of course we see a purposeful CCYR here. Okay, fair enough, but it's still above opening price at the moment. So to me is that this, will likely have more buying in the short term. Now the KSI itself is still staying green and they are new saying that, right? Uh, there are more people getting involved in the energy market. So I just believe that one day it will just break and it will go and the target is 109 as I mentioned to him. All right. So watch out for this crude oil. Now gold is expected to fall this morning. Now, flow, we can know that, right, today is a DJDD. Although it may not look slight, but it is, okay, it's a DJDD. So if today, if gold stays below OP, that will be selling down all the way to here, so which is the, the, this, uh, this MA200 and also below MLP. 
Now, KSI is red, but the red is low rate. So that means that the buying will already be coming soon. And because of that, right, KCX is so blinking for quite a while. So all these are the reasons to take note of it. Okay, that uh, it can go much better. Okay, all right. So this is the current goal situation. For silver, situation itself, right? Silver is also having a bit of uh, downdraft and now it's firming around $25.56. So I believe that, right, another trip downwards before going up, right, is very, very possible. All right, so traders just bear with it for silver, not yet to buy with for a while. This is Bitcoin. Okay, so you can see Bitcoin is still moving downwards. Now it tried to recover yesterday, but it just failed. And uh, it just got very strongly resisted by the MA30, and now it's trading below MLP. So my personal view is this, if this uh, is not gonna go higher, then that means that this particular thing will go down instead. And that's why I feel that 34,564, Right, we'll have to take a look at this. And if it happened itself right there, it'll be pretty good because now it's at 37,000. It's a long distance down all the way to here itself. Okay. Last one will be Ethereum. Ethereum is also supposedly to be going higher, but I've been stagnant for quite a while already. So now what we see is that blue bar is actually moving upwards. We can even try. So maybe the upside will reach about 28.54. All right, that's the outside of the uh, pull up. All right, over here. But if anything goes lower than this and it loses here, we will basically have further downside and it may again touch your BNB at sell point. And then it'll be 26, 24. Okay, all right. Okay, so that will be all for today's MAO, all right? I'm so sorry that my nose isn't doing that well. All right, I'll take a little break right now, but do not tonight, uh, from now till 2 a.m., I don't think the market will be moving much. So wait for 2 a.m. for US Federal Reserve to come in to tell you more about tonight, what's the direction. Will I be around? Yes, most likely I will be around. So let's see how it goes, all right? So guys, thank you for so much. Okay, yes, I'm not feeling very well. I'm under the weather. Yeah, so I'm going to take a little break right now. You guys do a part. Okay, do well. Make a lot of money. It's Cal signing off. Bye-bye.